All right, it's my pleasure now to welcome on former Carlton AFLW player, Shay Audley. Shay, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Sun shining, so you can't complain at all. No, that's it. We can't complain when we have good weather, especially after there's about 400 million drops of rain <laughs> last night, so it's always good to get that. Let's go way back to the beginning. What was your earliest memories of getting exposed to football? Um, so my brother always played um, junior football at Hurstbridge Football Club. So that was probably my first introduction to it. Um, I'd get, yeah, pulled along to his games every Sunday and and had to sit on the sidelines, I guess, watching the game. Um, and he was also uh, always made me go across to the park and, and have him practice his skills with him. So I guess I, I grew my love for it from him originally and um, then wanted to try it myself so I used to play at lunchtime with the boys at school at primary school and um it was I, I remember it was one weekend they were under 12 no it must have been under 11 started under 11 so um yeah one lunchtime I think I kicked a few goals um playing with the boys so they said oh we need someone to play on the weekend can you, go, can you come down and help us out with numbers and from from then, I didn't stop playing. So went down under 11s. Um, I remember dad was the water boy. Some weeks, the runner. Um, I think he did more run, like more yelling from the sidelines than he did delivering of messages. But, um, yeah, played under 11s, under 12s and under 13s down with the boys um, at Hurstbridge Footy Club. And, yeah, I was continued on from there um so had I had to stop after under 13. Talk about that because I know that sort of age limit where uh, girls can't continue to play footy after a certain age doesn't exist anymore but what was that like for you I can only imagine there's someone who's probably like pretty footy mad that would be absolutely heartbreaking. Oh it was and just not having that understanding I guess um I know this doesn't happen in every team when um, little girls were playing with the, in the boys team, but the the team that I played in, I just I never felt different. Like I, they were just always so inclusive, and and it was more. Um, I mean, it sounds a bit cliche, um, but it was more. I was I was surrounded by another twenty five brothers. Like I had my mates out there. It was always more a point of they protect me a little bit more, but I never felt like being a female was different. Like I never felt like um, I was excluded from anything other than the fact um, it, it got to a point probably in the under 13 that I didn't get changed in the same change rooms as them. But even back then, um, dad had to hunt down a different change area actually it probably wasn't dad at that stage because dad didn't have much understanding he was just you're one of the boys so you get changed where the boys get changed um it was probably more mum mum pushed for a different area for me to get changed in um in under 13 so I got put out the back they actually made a little um room out the back for me um for me to get changed in where the umpires were getting changed next door um, so it was an old toilet block that I, yeah, I got put in out the back. And I mean, that was no fault of, of Hurstbridge, but they, they hadn't had anyone um, that of female gender come through before me to play that higher age group. So I guess it was, it was a bit of a shock that I knew, I always knew it was coming, but I felt like when it got to under 14, I was going to deal with it. Oh, sorry, it jumped to under 15. So when it got to under 15s, I felt like I'd had enough luck every other year that something would come along and it would be all right. Like I'd get, I'd get through and I'd be able to play, but yeah, it never, it never got to that point. So I really wanted to still be out on the field with my team. So I actually still trained every Tuesday, Thursday, and I was the, I ended up being the runner for, um, for that team so every week I would literally sit or stand on the sidelines being the runner for a team that would struggle to get numbers every week but I wasn't allowed to be out there playing so 
I think when I, I it's probably when I look back at it more now, um, it, I just can't believe that it happened that way. Um, I understand at the same time though, like looking at um, even my students now, looking at males and females by that age, there is a big, is a big gap. Um, but it's probably just more disappointing that there wasn't another outlet for me to go and play like there is now um, with the girls leagues and, and um, girls teams that was probably the most disappointing thing. But I just remember every week, like literally every Thursday, um, I would talk to the coach and say, uh, the, how many we got this week? And he'd say, oh, we got one on the bench. And then so I'd go home to dad and, and I would get dad every week. I would convince him that I, I was allowed to play, but then the coaches would um, would say, no, we, we just can't risk it, I guess, was was the words that were used. So, yeah, in, in one word, just, just disappointing and, yeah, and heartbreaking. The way I sort of think about it, the first wave of AFLW players, there would be so many... Uh, there'll be so many people in your position who got to got a taste of it, then couldn't play for years. And then for a large part, probably gave it away and probably never came back to it. And I think that's a, a really sad thing to think about the fact that they probably were super talented, probably absolutely loved the sport, but for, you know, for justified reasons, you know, they fell out of love with it and, you know, never got to experience you know, the AFLW, which is, you know, just absolutely blown up and taken off and, it, it is sad and it's not very gra- glamorous when you sort of talk about the fact that you're in the shed out the back, but <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is. I don't, there's no other way to really put it. That is sort of disappointing. Talk about getting back into senior footy. I know there's a large age group or age bracket from, you know, making that jump up from say when you're 15 to going to play senior footy. What age did you do that? Um, so I actually went down to Diamond Creek Women's um, at 18. So I did a bit of athletics in between and Steph Chiochi, I um, met her and had a chat to her because she was always kicking the footy at the athletics track. And she'd kind of said, oh, I've started to go down and train with Diamond Creek um, probably when we were 16 or 17. And it took me till 18 to go down and at that stage um women's footy was more I think a, a social social event so I went down to training got there at six you know I was ready to run I was ready for that structured training that I guess I'd been used to watching um the boys up to the seniors training um and it just wasn't it just wasn't the same like I think yeah the and and it was and it was no one's fault it was just the way that footy was running at that stage like I think it was do a lap and then we'll work out what we're going to do from there and and yeah it just it wasn't for me at that stage going from such a structure and such serious footy to going to um I don't know you'd have have girls going off on the sidelines having a cigarette at quarter time and <laughs> and a and a drink kind of thing like it wasn't it just wasn't the footy that I'd remembered and the competition that I was looking for at the time. And then I think it might've been maybe even a year, a year or two later. And that's probably saying something for how quickly footy was moving at that stage. I went back down and, um, and the churches of the world and um, Bianca Richmond, another um name it down at diamond creek she they'd kind of got things moving and and the athleticism and everything had picked up a little bit and i think that getting a little bit more serious and people taking their footy a bit more serious was was what um reeled me back in so i got started probably around yeah probably around 1920 um again back with the seniors but um it's funny you say like that so many girls stopped playing because um, I, when going back to seniors, I, you kind of thought you were the only one. And, mm. and even, even going into AFLW, it was kind of like as, as a, the only girl at Hurstbridge Footy Club at the time, you, you did, you thought you were the only one. And then you're kind of like, oh, all these girls are playing like my sport. I've been playing since young age. And then all the stories started to come out that yeah so and so had to stop playing too so she just went and played basketball or she just went and played netball and 
And it was really interesting that the whole time I thought I was alone, yet there was so many other girls out there with a passion for footy that, yeah, that did get taken away from the game too. Yeah, I had this, I had a very similar experience. I used to play ice hockey and as you can probably imagine, it's not a very popular sport in Australia. And yeah. when I was about 16, I went to this just shithouse rink in Oakley, which is the, in the middle of nowhere from where I'm from. And I remember like seeing all of these people who were playing and I was like, how is there this many people who are interested in this like sport, which I felt like at the time, I'm like, I'm the only one who watches this and wants to play. So it was a surreal experience, but your um, description of your, the footy with the taking a drink and having a cigarette a quarter time sounds a lot like mine and my yeah. ideal, um, my ideal type of football. Like when I played at Heidelberg West, we would lose by 200 points every week. And at quarter time, there would be the coach would have no one to talk to because everyone's just gone off to the side for a dart. And <laughs> it was, I was, I was okay with that. I was terrible at football and that was actually yeah. the most enjoyable part to it. So that is, <laughs> it's very funny how differently our minds work on that. Yeah. I, oh, don't get me wrong off the field. I was not a cigarette, but I was definitely, <laughs> I was definitely up for the drinking side of it. And, um, and, and I can um, relate massively to that too because we we had a few seasons there at the start of Diamond Creek where yeah okay maybe the training had got more serious and and the girls were getting a bit more um athletic ability but we had games the same we were getting pumped by 150 200 points and your motivation running back to the center was who's going to get the drink card today and and I guess <laughs> that's um, nothing to do with the results was, of the game oh, yeah, and how quickly you were back to the other end where they're kicking another goal and then you were running back to the centre. That's really, in those early days, that's that's all we had um, had going for us, that who would get the pub voucher or the, the pizza voucher for the week, which, um, which yeah, it, it kept us motivated, kept us going. And then, and then we did get, get to a very high level of um, the Victorian Women's Football League. So... I don't know if you've got to start start low with those kind of motivations. I guess it will eventually get you there. Hey, whatever motivates anyone, I have no, I have no, I have no qualms, no, no issues with that. Let's talk about um, AFLW and your experience there. So you were drafted 46 in the first ever AFLW draft by Carlton. First off, what was that experience like to be drafted and to you know to sort of be recognised as, I guess, the 46 best. Um, female footballer in the country yeah well to be fair on the day I was a little bit shitty because I was meant to go earlier oh no <laughs> and uh, and oh if anyone if anyone listening knows um Graham Bergen he's he he can definitely um talk the talk I love his guts but he he told me I was going at 26 so I think it was 26 so, or I'm just getting confused with my number but anyway it was earlier than 46 so he told me at whatever pick Carlton had, I'm going at that. So he's worded me up and I am I had at the time, I was a primary school teacher. So I had probably four grades of preps and grade ones all sitting in a room. Um, and one of my best mates worked as a teacher there too. So I wasn't meant to, but I'd worded her up that, you know, wait for this number and it's on. And it got to Carlton's pick and they didn't call my name. Um, And I'm looking at her, she's looking back at me and you just, you don't know. And at that stage, it was such a, such an innocent thing. Like someone told you that this was going to happen on draft day, you believe them, but not knowing that it was also a business. So things could change on the day. And if they saw um, something was running in a certain way or another team had picked up another player and that opened up, um, someone that they needed they were going to go for them but but we didn't understand all that we hadn't been through it all before so I just assumed they had their list and they were going through their list and and picking who they wanted at each number so it was really nerve-wracking that day I just felt sick like to my stomach that um, yeah I'd been told one thing and I thought I had in my head I was going to Carlton and I thought oh and and no offense now but at the time I thought if I go to Collingwood I don't know if I'm going to be able to put on their jumper like um being a mad Richmond supporter and um 
yeah, being against Collingwood and everything I did in life, I just thought, oh, so that was probably another thought going through my head. Um, but then the draft was actually running really late as well. So we were entertaining and I had um, a camera there from the local newspaper as well. Um, so that just added to the nerves. I just thought, imagine if I'm, my name doesn't get called out. I've got four grades sitting here. Really, they didn't know what was going on. But They're getting it was more, Yeah, more the paper in my face, like the camera for the paper in my face. And I'm like, and I'm not going to get called out. So um, I eventually did. We had to practice a few times the cheering and, and pretending <sighs> with the, the prep and the grade one. Um grade that my name did get called out and then so when it finally did um the atmosphere wasn't quite as electric as we would have hoped because they the kids are so sort of tuned times. out they're like yeah you, was that your name oh no it's all good yeah it, was, it came before yeah. oh well, yeah we've already done it four times like they missed their recess so they were a bit shitty about that as well <laughs> um so yeah it, it didn't all go to yeah, it didn't all go to plan, but the fact that my name did get called out, oh, I was just ecstatic. And you, you didn't know what was coming, which was probably the most exciting thing. Um, and I called I called mum. She started crying. Um, I called dad. He, yeah, he was just like, yeah, I heard. Yep, I got, I got a message. Like, so um, Thanks, he man. was, ob- yeah, ob- obviously um, – very proud but yeah I think he'd done his celebrating earlier too practiced a few times so um it was an unbelievable day and then the club called us all in with our families that night um and we yeah met all our new teammates which a lot of them were our opposition um from like local competition so that was good to I guess kind of turn your opinion around on them because you'd only met them on the field and had chats after games, after being opposition with them. So, um, and then we all, as, as Creekers, we all met up after that and, and had a big celebration together out at the pub that night. So that was really good too. How many, um, how many girls from your team at Diamond Creek were drafted? I think in the end it was going off memory. I think it was 14 originally. Um, so there was a lot of it. Yeah. We were, we were one of the most with Darabin, um, we were the, one of the most represented teams. Um, and then I think it was one or two of the girls actually got picked up as free agents after that as well. So yeah, I think around 14, 12 or 14, it ended up being, which was, yeah, awesome. And then still, some are still playing now who originally got drafted. Wow. That is, um, very, very impressive. Diamond Creek were always a very strong uh, team to play against. I have a good story about uh, my junior um, achievements, if you could call it that, against Diamond Creek. Yeah. I played for Greens Bar, and I think it was like under 13s, and they had 19 players. So yeah. one was on the bench, and that was me. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and I did come on. I played full forward in a game where a kid uh, kicked 26 or 27 goals. Oh and my I th- god! I think we kicked one point, which was on the siren. So as full forward, <laughs> I didn't really get near it. Um, and he was in the he was in the Diamond Valley leader like the that the next day. Um, so yeah, so I don't have fond memories <laughs> um, playing at Diamond Creek. That's for sure. Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> and it, and at that age, um, you wouldn't have been going to have a, a smoke and a drink to um, make you feel better at <laughs> half time either. <laughs> I'm born and raised in Reservoir, so never assume <laughs> what I wasn't wasn't doing at yeah, 13. Like... <laughs> uh, you, you sort of mentioned before that it was kind of a large unknown about what to sort of expect with it. What what was your what was your initial sort of I guess thought process after you'd been drafted as to you know what you're sort of going to expect? Yeah, so I guess because you always dreamed to play AFL. Um I guess growing up as a kid, I say you always dream. Like it was just something that I, as a kid, I I just always wanted to play AFL. And I told the um the paper a story that um when I was in year seven, we had to do a time capsule and write down what you wanted to do when you grew up. Um, what was your ultimate goal basically? And I wrote down that I wanted to play um AFL for Richmond, and um 
mum always anything I wanted to do mum always backed it you know you can you put your mind to it you can do it type of attitude um but this was probably the first time she shut me down and oh, and just mum yeah yeah and just explain to me like because my whole thing was deemed that I thought something would just come about that they'd seen me play um I, I was in the best and fairest I mean you think back now it sounds stupid but I was in the best and fairest under 11s, under 12s, under 13s. So they'd see me play, like men, men's footy would see me play. And Yeah, mum, um, I'm, I'm really fucking good. <laughs> yeah, so I will be playing with the men, against the men. <laughs> and she had to, um, yeah, she had to let me down gently with that, that that wouldn't be happening. So um, I guess always being a dream, you just thought like dreams are, everything would be great. Like you'd get to AFL. And when AFLW became available, everything would be great. Like you'd have the resources, you'd have amazing coaches. Um, you just, you go every week and it's like local. You don't have to worry about anything. You get picked every week and you just play footy. Like I just assumed that that, that was the way AFLW was going to work. You were part of the first game at Icon Park. What were your expect expectations going into that and sort of how did it measure up? Because it was like you know so, sold out it was absolutely it was even above my expectations for it, it was absolutely sensational to see yeah um the, i i don't think my expectations even even living out my dream i don't think my expectations um came anywhere near what that was like it was just unreal and and i look back on videos and things now like i had um, Lorimer Primary School, where I was working at the time, they, um, one of my yeah good mates made up all pictures of me, and they all had rulers with a photo of me in the crowd, and um, had a chant going like chanting out my name, and um, it was just unreal. Like I loved actually a big memory from that game was one of my friends Lauren Brazali, who still plays at Carlton now. She, I think her dad, who's an intelligent man, um, said to her, just take it in, like take a minute and just look around and take it in. And um, at the time I was kind of like, to her, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Like, and we were standing there for the national anthem and she'd said it to me and I just looked around and oh, I, there's actually, I say to people and it sounds stupid and I might eventually find words for it but there are actually no words to describe it like it was just insane and then I guess after the game um to find out how many people were actually there watching us and that people were banging down a gate and yelling at Gil McLaughlin to get in um mm. it, it just blew it up even more yeah um so yeah it was in it was just incredible and I, I still I still remember running over at the end of the game to my family and, and I got a photo on the fence with all of them behind me, um, cousins and aunties and uncles and, yeah, just mum. It makes me emotional talking about it. Um, yeah. Mum, mum standing there with badges on and, yeah, you, yeah, exactly what I thought the dream would be. Yeah, it's I think for a lot of athletes when, you know, they make, they play the first game or whatever it is that you, it's natural to go back through your whole career and go like, holy shit, I literally have made it here. But for, you know, someone like you who sort of got involved, had it taken away and had to do things, you know, a very, very hard way if we're looking at it from an, uh, an AFL point of view, like it's so, it, it, it's so much more special in my opinion to the fact that, yeah, you were able to have your family there and, you know, you weren't sure what to expect. And then all of a sudden there's 25,000 people there. There's people who couldn't get in. And it's just, I saw a photo of the both teams lined up for the, the national anthem and it is such a, such a cool photo. So, I mean, it's only, it's only understandable that you don't really even, you know, a few years on have the truly have the words to describe it because it's such a special experience. hundred percent. And, and I think, um, it, it was just a, such a huge, huge part of what is to come as well. And I don't think at the time we realised that either. Um, mm. Like one of my cousins who was in the crowd said, um, I just broke down. She was like, I just could not stop crying at the fact that, that 
not even just women's football, but a women, a woman's sport had got to this stage as a sports person herself, knowing where it come from. So I think that's why I get a little bit emotional about it now because it's so exciting with what's to come. Um, I teach an academy here and I just try and reiterate to these girls that you do have the pathway and you have these opportunities that are huge um, that basically started on that night. Yeah, I, I don't want to make you too emotional, but you you have a daughter, um, a young yeah. daughter, and how special is it that you don't have to you don't have to uh, a tell her hey you can't do this or you can't do that, and that she will actually be able to grow up and idolize AFLW players and just know that she has all the opportunities in the world that sort of weren't there when you were playing. Yeah, it's, it is it's very, it is very emotional um, to even talk about it. Like you could see as soon as you said it, the smile on my face. Like um, the other day, actually, just to put it into concept, like the other day um, she had a, she got a footy out from under the pram and she was running with the footy. Like, and I just thought, you, you will never know. I was actually going to put it up as a post. I'm, I'm just saving it for a quiet day and I'll put it up. But um, she, she will... Yeah, yeah, get a bit more. <laughs> she will she'll never know that women didn't play footy. Like you go you go down to the Oval and there's an equal amount of girls there as there is boys there and there's an equal amount of women and men playing footy now that um it will be it will actually be a shock now to her like it was a shock to me that women didn't play footy. Um we'll tell her I can tell her those stories and and let her know basically what the journey was for us to have to get there. And, and that will be a shock for her. Like the fact that there are women's change rooms now, there are women's competitions now um, that she will just see as, as a normal part of life. It, it just makes me so happy that if she does choose footy, um, she's got every opportunity in the world, the same as the boys and the men do have. Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful. And it is great to see that, uh, I believe coming into next year, every uh, every AFL club will have both a uh, will have both men's and women's teams. Is that right? Yeah, I I'm pretty sure. Or um, 2023. I think yeah. it, it is. It's nearly at that point. So Essendon um, and Hawks will come into it, and um, then yeah, by I think 2023. There'll be every, yeah, every women's team will have, uh, sorry, every male and female team will be represented by every club. Yeah, no, it's absolutely amazing stuff. One of the most underappreciated things about AFLW plays is the fact that you've sort of touched on it. Uh, you were a primary school teacher. Um, most, of the, most of the athletes are full-time athletes and they have full-time jobs outside of that. Explain how hard it is to juggle that. And I, I, I guess, uh, h- how do you do it? Um, you, while you're doing it, I don't think you realise how hard it is. Um, and it's not until you do sit back like that. Probably that year that I, um, the year I got dropped from Carlton and then went and played VFL, that was probably the year that I realised how hard it had been. Um, for those past three years because you're just in you're just in the um, the motion of doing what you have to do. You go to work, um, you're organized for training that ne- that night and even even getting organized for the weekend as well. you just always had to be on top of things. And I guess being a primary school teacher, um, being a teacher in general helped because I was organized. Um, and I guess my schools have always been really supportive in terms of if I needed a Friday off or, um, or I needed a Monday off, say, if we were traveling, that they've supported that. But it was tough. Like you were basically doing your full-time job. Well, you were. You were doing your full-time job. And then they say part-time, but it was basically another full-time job because you – if, if you weren't at training, say that three, four times a week, you were doing gym. So you were mm. getting up and, I, and I'm not saying no one else does it hard too, like, um, but you were getting up in the morning and you had to fit your gym in around your full-time job. So I remember there would be 
two times a week where I would get up at five, four thirty-five in the morning, go and do my gym, then then get organized for school, do school and then say have a meeting um in the afternoon and then you'd be set getting set for your next day. Like and primary school teaching is probably um there's a lot of planning involved. So I wouldn't leave I wouldn't leave on those non-training nights till 6, 6.30 because you were catching up from those nights that you had to leave earlier on training nights. Yeah. Um, so it was and, – and it was just always you didn't stop. Like it was go. You'd run from your meeting at school to get to training. Then you'd have um, – I guess they were trying to, at that early stages, run it as the same as a men's – um, a men's club so you would sometimes have an hour an hour and a half meeting before you'd actually get on the track um, and Carlton are doing it a lot better now and it's by no one's fault but we didn't we didn't know it was all we were the guinea pigs um, basically so at the start we were sometimes leaving the club at and it was and it was made to be a bit of a joke because it just got ridiculous we were sometimes leaving the club at 10 30 at night like quarter to 11 at night um, and then getting up that next morning at 4.35 to do your gym. Like it was, yeah. No, it, um, it, and, and things, as I said, things did get better. Um, people started to realise that it was not sustainable to be doing that. Um, and I guess as, as money and payments got better too, it, it brought a bit of relief that, um, say a, a teachers could go down to four days a week or three days a week. So you did have that, that little break, but yeah, that was, that was for people who didn't have a mortgage for people who um, were, I guess the top level players that were getting paid a little bit more, but for someone like me, who was mediocre getting um, not, not the best of contracts, you still had to work full time because your mortgage wasn't getting paid otherwise. Um and I mean, I was grateful that I had a house, but that was just the way it worked. So yeah, that, that time, the first probably two years was, was really full on. Um, and I guess that's where things changed a little bit from that dream you saw as, um, as a little kid that AFL was just playing footy and you had all the resources and you had all, everything was smooth sailing. I guess that that's where that changed a little bit that there was a lot of stresses and um, it was very exhausting times that came with, with just playing footy as well. Do you think the AFL and the clubs involved in the early stages probably underestimated what they had and that, you know, as you sort of touched on the fact that we're having meetings that are going to like 11 o'clock just because they're kind of like, Oh shit, we're unorganized here. Or I got unorganized there. Yeah. And and I guess because there was a lot of there was a lot of fresh faces to footy. There was a lot of um, women who were just new to footy, so there was so much education that we needed. Um, yes, I'd I'd played since juniors, but I'd also had um, John's dad who came down and coached and and didn't and didn't necessarily teach me strategies of the game or when you're playing under. 11s 12s 13s you get in the ball and you're kicking it like um so it yeah it it probably was more due to that fact that we needed a lot more education than males that had been through the TAC pathway and already had um higher educated coaches that had give, given given them that development that we were still lacking and so it was basically like a bit of a catch-up game you played 19 games with Carlton. Do you remember one game where you absolutely flogged it? Like everyone remembers a game where you're like, I was on here. Most of my games were pretty paltry, so I can remember easy. But is there a game that stands out where you're like, I may have just clocked this? <laughs> um, I think, well, I've watched the highlight of, of this game probably the most. Um, I think it, I'm pretty sure it was GWS and it was only – and I know you're not meant to go by goals, but let's be honest, we all love kicking a goal. Um, and it was the most awkward kick. Like, I think I came through a pack and I um, just put it on my boot and it looked really ugly, but my celebration was really good. So, <laughs> and, That's the most um, important thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, who's looking at the goals? And um, 
one of my like one of my really good one of my yeah best mates in the team who played for Dymo as well um she was the first one I ran to and so it was just us celebrating and then the rest of the team got around me because you know when you don't usually kick goals everyone loves when you do kick one so um I think yeah that game against GWS probably would have been and I think my tackles which I was I was known for um I think my tackles were really high that day too. So I probably I probably say that was my that was my on day. As someone who's been involved with uh with women's football, I, I guess from the, the early days and experience some of the the lower moments and sort of now seeing a boom, what is your opinion on the whole rise uh, from a game as a whole and where where do you think the game can sort of go from where it is today? Um I I'm just excited. Like I see I play um VFL I played VFL with Essendon in 2018 and the kids coming through like I say kids because I'm allowed to now because I'm 33 so um I'm I'm allowed to call them kids but the ones coming through now it they are just electric like they have had that exact opportunity that we were talking about that I, I missed out on that under 13s they didn't have to stop so um, their skill development and going into AFLW, they they know what footy is. They've had all that education. That ha- they've had all that development that the boys um, have have always had, and it's just so exciting to watch. They just they are just seamless with their skills, with their knowledge, with their strategies, um, and and that's probably what's what's exciting for me now just to watch and I do sometimes in VFL like I run my guts out but sometimes I just sit back and watch them and um Georgia Patricio I can't say her last name but she knows who she is um for the Saints I used to say to her like you don't even look like you're trying and you just like silky smooth through everyone and you're just so calm about it whereas I'm like ready to ready to go with anyone that says anything to me and just have this, um, I guess, fight in me that, that she just takes, takes everything so calmly. And, um, I used to say to her, it pisses me off a lot because, um, I don't know how people can be so calm on a footy field, but people like her and, um, and Maddie Preston like they just, the way they go about the game and where they're taking our game is just so exciting. Um, it worries me a little bit getting getting teams in so quickly. Having, um, and I know that sounds stupid because someone who would want to promote women's footy, and I'm all about promoting women's footy, but it, it just worries me. And I'm hoping that it's not moving moving too quickly. Um, but at the same time, if it does, I'm sure there'll be more more talent that stands up and and gets a go, and and hopefully we just keep moving forward with it. Yeah, no, I don't think you're totally wrong in saying that. I think there is there is one thing that to be sort of cautious about is when you do add so many teams, the, I guess the the talent pool that you're drafting from, like you, you have the potential to lopside teams, I guess, where you sort of have such a, a, a big gap in between, you know, your sort of star players and the, the players who are, I guess, mid-tier players. And so sometimes that can create a little bit of uh, disparity in the league. But no, it, it is sort of, it is great to see that, you know, you are getting those girls coming through now, which are, have not had any break from footy and they've got the skills, they've got the strategic knowledge, which is super important. Who is your favourite player to watch? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um. I do. I like the way um, Ebony Marinoff, Marabinoff goes about her game. Um, she plays for the Crows. She's hard at it. Um, I also, I'm just trying to think. I actually can't narrow it down. Katie Loins, who I said I celebrated that goal with, um, she's awesome to watch because she just breaks packs like no other. Comes through. Um, Georgia G, another little one from Carlton. She's an absolute gun, um, one to watch. I know there'll be someone as soon as I get off the podcast, I'll be like, oh, her, she was a gun. Like there's a lot of um, 
a lot of Saints players that are new up and coming um, players that you just watch and what Peter Searle, I think, brought to their team. She's not there anymore this season, but what she brought to their team, it just looked like she gave them the confidence to play footy. And I don't think she over overcomplicates things. So um, there was a few girls that I can't even pinpoint them at the moment, but I think I think the Saints will be a team to watch moving forward um, just because, and I hope the new coach um, keeps instilling that confidence because I think, I think female footballers, and I guess males too, but being inexperienced with female footballers, I think that is a huge, huge thing that if they have confidence, um, that's when we see them playing their best footy. So, um, yeah, few few St Kilda players, um, which, yeah, it's just, as soon, as I said, as soon as I get off the podcast, it, names will just start popping in my head, but they're definitely a team to watch. Yeah, 100%. I think Brianna Davey might be one of the players that will come to your head because she is a freak of nature. I oh, love yeah. watching her play footy. She is very, very... Very exciting to watch. And Victoria Park is very close to where I live. So um, getting down to see her play is definitely something I'm going to be doing this year. Um, let's talk about, you mentioned sort of the, the as, you came, as you came into sort of your second and third year, you sort of realized that the dream was, I guess, not, not drifting away, but you sort of realized that there are a lot of things that you probably didn't anticipate when you, you know, originally get involved in this talk about that. And I guess how sort of how hard it can be to go through that, you know, delisting and sort of transition process. Yeah. So um, I guess because things did, did feel like they were, they were smoother sailing probably season one and season two um, where I did play every game. I didn't, I didn't find probably until season three that I, I actually found it really hard. Like it got to a point where you just felt like you were doing everything. Um, and, and looking back on it now, I guess I blamed probably a lot of different things. Um, yeah, you, you just feel like you get in a bit of a spiral when you're not getting picked for games and you're not really getting any reason behind that. Um, that was the year that we ended up playing in the grand final for Adel uh, against Adelaide in Adelaide. And um, the team were going really well. So I got dropped. Um, I got dropped after round two in that season and actually didn't get back in the team. And yeah, it was a really hard season. And, and I think it was more hard because I became someone that I didn't want to be. Um, I remember there was one game where, um, and I actually haven't said this to anyone, but there was one game where I, we were sitting as a team watching, like the, the people who'd missed out didn't get to travel. So we were all sitting at Icon Park watching the, watching the game. And I've always been a team player, probably, probably to the point where um, people have said to me, like playing AFLW, there are games where you just need to take it on and be a bit more selfish because... Unfortunately, that's that's what it got to in um, some points of AFLW. And um, I felt like I went away from that being a team player a bit, watching that game from the sidelines because it, it got so competitive for your spot that you tried to make yourself feel better in any way you could. But And, and it got to a point where I was probably um, not putting down teammates, but trying to nitpick things from other teammates because I wanted to make myself feel better or wanted my wanted myself to have a reason for getting back in the team. So I probably, that's probably where I um, felt most stressed because yeah, because I was in such a spiral that I wasn't myself and I wasn't um, things were coming out that probably weren't me because I was so stressed about not being in control of being able to get back in the team. Um, and I'd never, I'd never had a sporting situation where I'd gone through that before. And I guess you didn't, you weren't educated on that either. You were just expected to accept that and, and know that you're not going to be picked every week, but no one was kind of giving the support or the help on how you deal with that either. So I think that season was really hard and like um, it, it got to a point where coaches would say, you know, 
I remember there was one training session and that's probably the training session when you said, was there a game where you thought I've clocked this? Mm. That was probably the training session that I thought I am on. Like mm. I was a combination of Taylor Harris, Katie Lloyd, like Aaron Phillips. I'll even throw in combination of Aaron Phillips. Um, like I'm the my best tra- to ever do this. Yeah. That, that training. Yeah. You, you name it. I'm them. Um, that training session. I just thought if I don't get picked for this week, then I'm not getting picked again. Like, um, and yeah. And so they'd already, and that was the other thing too. So, um, sorry, I'm going back off track a bit. So you'd have the game on say a Sunday, you'd have recovery on a Monday, um, which in recovery, you didn't do actually much training. So I would miss out on a game of the people who would miss out on a game on a weekend. There was nowhere for you to go and play. So Mm. you're missing out playing footy. You can't prove yourself anywhere. Then you've got recovery Monday where you're in ice baths and doing stretching. Really for us, that was... I feel fine. I'm not going to do this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Then you'd have, say, the Wednesday where it would be a session, but they've already been looking at what team they're going to select on the Tuesday. So no matter how you're training on the Wednesday, they've basically... It, it, it was really going off your hoping, which is horrible, but you're hoping someone else plays shit so then you get a spot because training, how you trained really didn't come down to it because the team was already selected by the time you got a chance to train. Yeah. So I remember this session, um, going back to it, I remember this session really clearly that, um, yeah, train the house down and we came back in and all the coaches went back into another meeting and I thought, they never go back into another meeting. Like it's really strange. And they actually came out and the head coach at the time said to me, um, we actually had to have another meeting about you because of how you trained. And we had to give reasons as to not why you weren't in, but what, like, why, why weren't you being chosen this week? Mm -hmm. Um, And we had no reasons why you weren't being chosen this week, but we just had no one to bring out. So um, I reckon that was, I got what dropped round for round three, round four. I reckon that was for round five. And um, so I got named emergency for that round. But like you're sitting there like. Well, I can't do well, anything more. No. Nah. So, yeah, you're doing, you're doing extras. You're, you're pushing, you're training like you've never trained before. And they literally said, oh, we've got no reason why you're not in the team, but you're not in the team. Mm. So, yeah, I found that really hard. Yeah, it, it, it's if we sort of touch on what we sort of mentioned before with the fact that they probably didn't understand what they had. This is such a large part of the game behind the game, I guess you could you could say. For a large part, if you haven't been a professional athlete, you don't know about this whole side of the business and the fact that you're if you're a professional athlete usually your entire childhood playing the sport is spent just absolutely shit kicking whoever you've whoever you've played you've never missed teams you've never been dropped and then all of a sudden you're getting into that sort of level playing field and then you have to experience this whole thing and it literally can throw you into that spiral as you sort of mentioned like such a large mental part of the game which can ultimately destroy all the confidence that you know you've had for so long like you know you can play this game but you're 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 sitting there doubting yourself and then you know, you talked about the fact that you know you went away from the person you wanted to be and the style of game you wanted to play and, and if you don't have that sort of support system in place like it literally can you know create that spiral that's you know that that people can't come out of yeah 100 percent. and and you do you see I'm lucky I've, I've got family. I've got, I've got lots of friends that, that I could go back to. And I had that. And, and you know what, that probably helped me um, going back to being a teacher and, and having something outside of footy um, to identify as a teacher, as well as a football player. But that's why I think a lot of these, um, the men who, who are identified as just not just, but as football players, they don't have, that's all they know. So they get an injury, they get dropped from, from AFL. They, they can't go back in the classroom and, and be known as Shay the teacher or, or Shay the friend or 
um, Shay, the partner, like they're only known as the footballer. So that's where their spiral continues to go down because they, they don't have an outlet. So I guess in a way, having a full-time job too gave me that outlet. So I, I guess it, it's say, not saying that I was in a really, really dark place or anything like that, but it gave me that outlet that I wasn't just identifying as a footballer. So I had something to take my mind off it. I know it's probably natural for an experience like this to sour how you view how how you view a sport or sort of how you feel playing it. And you can kind of feel out of the love of it. Now you had, we mentioned your daughter before you had a daughter and you've come back and played footy and you actually won the best in fairest for diamond Creek last year. Was that a huge thing for you sort of coming back into footy and I guess at a, a less serious environment, a lot more relaxed, so sort of around more friends or whatever and returning to that, shit kicking of other of other people basically <laughs> yeah well I went um I got my love back for footy because I was I was a bit sour and as I said I became a person I really didn't didn't like at that stage I remember even um even getting dropped one one week I walked into the coaches um and you like at AFLW you saw your coaches you don't argue with them like you don't and I walked into the room selectors I think it was for the second last round or something and I said not in again this week thanks and just walk straight back out um, and their jaws just dropped like, like you can't say like, that to us yeah and they're like oh it's oh it's nah, nah. and I was like nah I'm done and I just and because they'd actually they told me the week before that the team yeah so round five I was emergency they told me the week after that the teams haven't hadn't changed but I was an emergency, so I'd, I was by that stage. I've had the greatest training of my life. I've been told I'm emergency, and then I've been dropped from emergency, and I didn't even do anything wrong. So, as you say, I was a bit sour by that stage. But um, I went to Essendon 2000 and must have been 18, and that's where my love came back for footy. Like, uh, it was just the best there. It was the culture, um, the coach, major. It was just amazing, and that's and I was having fun again, and and you do lose that when you become at the highest level. So, um, that was great, but yeah, then um, I fell pregnant, and obviously it was a bit much um, being pregnant and playing and footy. Trying so, to play footy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually did a two um, k time trial while I was pregnant, not knowing that I was pregnant, and I got the best time that I ever have. So. <laughs> Um, that is unbelievable I and the girl that I beat in the team I had to um apologize and I said like to do my announcement of pregnancy at Essen and I said there was actually two of us running the race so um I'm sorry that I cheated in that but yeah so, <laughs> um so anyway yeah then I had Maddie um I tried to go back to Essendon I trained for I think Maddie was three months old and I went back and trained at Essendon for five weeks and it was just too much like I hate not giving everything 100% so putting 50% into that and 50% into being a mum um, just didn't work at the time so I went back to Diamond Creek and um, it was really good down there um, the girls are great like it, it's probably it's it was hard at the same time too because <laughs> At VFL and AFL level, you get a little bit complacent that you you got your uniform washed for you, you know, you put your socks in a in a bin at the end of the day, and someone yeah. else goes and washes them. And, um, You're leaving all your shit on the floor, and someone's like, "What are you doing?" Like, someone doesn't wash this. To be, to be fair, like when I put it in at Essendon, I I folded it up and put it in nicely. <laughs> I start doing that at Diamond Creek and people like, but it, it's the complete opposite. And it's only like VFL to what I went to is really only one level down. Like, cause we're the highest in um, community level at Div 1. So it's only one level down, but boy, is it, is it a very different game and um, a very different setup that you have to find your own volunteers to do water, to do runner, to do everything every week. Um, and, it, and that is a shit fight to find someone every week to do. You don't know if you're going to need a boundary umpire until the Saturday before the Sunday game. Like, um, as amazing as it was, it was. it's probably ended up being 
harder work being at a local club than it did being at um being at a VFL club. But yeah, it was a good experience going back to where it all started too. Shay, thank you so much. That was an absolutely incredible chat. And thank you for being a very pivotal part and paving the way for uh, not only um, not only women and for women's sport, but also for sport in this country in general. There are a lot of women like you who had to do it the hard way to make sure the AFLW became a thing. And um, everyone is going to be grateful for the hard work that uh, you all had to do. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for... Um, for having it coming on for a chat today. Thanks so much, Chris. I really appreciate your words. That's awesome. I really appreciate you having me too. Thank you. No, that, the pleasure was all mine.